every night when I go to sleep, I know. There's no pretending. There's no, uh, there's no undoing. There's no wiping it out. There's no whitewashing it. It's there. It's a fact. It happened, and I was a part of it. Susan Atkins was a part of the most chilling murder spree in Californian history. I feel that there are eight lives that had I not been involved, they may still be alive today. Eight worthwhile human beings who had the right to live and they're no longer alive. And that's something that I live with every day. I can, I'm sorry. Uh, there are, there really are. After 17 years in prison, the woman, usually described as America's most vicious murderess, says she's found God. And after years of silence, Susan Atkins has given us an extraordinary new version of the Manson murders. She now says she was a witness, but not a killer. I've spoken the truth as I've talked to you. And the truth is I never killed anybody. I lied at the grand jury. I lied at the trial and said that I killed people that I in fact did not. I live with that knowledge. I live with the fact that people think that I killed a pregnant woman eight and a half months pregnant. As you listen to more of Susan Atkins' remarkable turnaround, you'll get a chance to judge whether or not she's changed. She certainly looks and sounds different to when she was one of the Manson girls laughing their way through the murder trials. family lived in the desert near Los Angeles under the hypnotic spell of Charles Manson. He's also in jail and he's also eligible for parole, but the feeling is he'll never go free. I read the other day where I had magical powers and I told everybody in the chapel, I said, zap, 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 zap. I said, where's my magical powers? Uh, well, you can't read, you can't believe what you read in the press. I can get no magical powers, mystical trips and all that kind of crap. Charlie Manson sent out his family, a family of killers, up here into the Hollywood Hills, believing that they could start a war between blacks and whites. First, the family went creepy crawling, as they put it, breaking into these big houses at night while the people were sleeping. And then, with knives and guns, they began to murder the rich and the famous with a kind of horror and viciousness even Hollywood wasn't prepared for. How had Charlie instructed you to behave when this was happening? Mercilessly, coldly and brutally terrorizing people. I wasn't instructed to show any mercy. Uh, the motive of the Manson family was to attain uh, political power in the United States. They wanted to start a race war between blacks and whites. Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay helped put the Manson family behind bars. Now he's fighting to keep them in jail because he says they're a threat to society. Manson, the family, would at least rule the United States. It was never clear if they were going to rule the world, but at least the United States. The Manson family's most famous victim was the 26-year-old actress Sharon Tate, the wife of film director Roman Polanski. Manson picked a house, and Sharon Tate happened to be there. For no other reason than that, her life ended. And what a terrible end it was. On a hot August night in 1969, part of the Manson family, Susan Atkins, Tex Watson, and Patricia Krenwinkel, carried out what the prosecutor later called the most horror-filled hour of murder in American criminal history. At Sharon Tate's house over there, they butchered five people. Susan Atkins confessed during her trial that they kept Sharon until last to make her suffer. She was eight and a half months pregnant. Everybody was terrified. It was a terrifying, horrible... Can we not talk about this? This is really hard for me to talk about it. Well, Susan Atkins was the actual killer of Sharon Tate. One of the worst things that she did was during the course of the uh, uh, the stabbing, uh, she drank Sharon Tate's uh, blood and uh, she said that she was so turned on by the, uh, the murder and drinking the blood that she had an orgasm. 
The district attorney says you drank Sharon Tate's blood. I never did that. The district attorney says that you said it was better than orgasm. I never said that to the district attorney. Sharon Tate uh, uh, was asking for uh, God and, uh, and her mother and just pleading for her baby. She said, all I want is to have my baby. Penny Bryce is to the left here, and um, Bing Crosby's family is right over here. Sharon Tate Polanski and her unborn baby are buried in LA's Holy Cross Cemetery. Among all who come to see the graves of the Hollywood legends, there's no sadder visitor than her mother, Mrs. Doris Tate. How do you remember Sharon? I remember as an eternal 26-year-old girl, you know, a woman that was beginning her, um, her family. What Doris Tate cannot comprehend is how her pregnant daughter could be stabbed to death by a young woman who was a mother herself. She begged and she begged and she begged. And Susan Atkins' reply again was, shut up, bitch, you're going to die. The court transcripts show that you said, shut up, bitch, I'm going to kill you. And now Susan Atkins is asking for parole. But every time she appears before the parole board, Doris Tate is there pleading that she be kept inside forever. I live with these screams and these beggings for her last baby. The first time that I saw her, I could have taken her by the neck and just broke every bone in her body, just throwing her down, you know? They have proven they cannot live in, in a society with other people. I don't know that Mrs. Tate could ever forgive me. My hope is that someday she will, not as a means for me to be released, but as a means for her to find some peace. I know the pain and the suffering that I caused Mrs. Tate. The tears are fake. I feel that uh, Susan Atkins is um, a Sarah Bernhardt on the stage. A classy little actress. A classy little actress, absolutely. But listen to Susan Atkins and she'll tell you it's not an act. After 17 years in prison, seven of them in solitary, she says she's paid the price. You know, I had to forgive myself. And that's not something that I did overnight. That's not something that I think I've totally accomplished. It's a day-by-day -day process. There are times when I lay and I cry because of what I did, because of the pain that I caused so many people. She says she feels, but she has not said she's sorry for what she did. I haven't heard this woman say, I am truly sorry for what I did. Can you get out the words and say to Sharon Tate's parents that you're sorry for what you did that night? You ask hard questions. There are no words to describe what I feel. I'm sorry. Oh, please forgive me. Those words are so overused and inadequate for what I feel. So which Susan Atkins do you believe? The Charlie's angel who joked about murder? Or this sad-eyed convert to Christianity? I know that I would not want, if my son were brutally murdered, I would not want to walk around hating every day of my life somebody for killing my child. It may not be hate, Susan. Maybe people can't understand you, the fact that you were involved in those I don't, killings. I don't understand myself and the fact that I was involved in those things Could 16, you 17 years ago. But I understand what you're saying, that people cannot understand. They look at me and they see this. They see me as I sit here today. I look in the mirror and I find it difficult to believe that I was ever involved in something like that. You mean they think you're a monster? Yeah, a and devil. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a human being. I'm a human being that got caught up in drugs. I'm a human being that got caught up into listening to a maniac. 
and I followed him, and I hurt and destroyed a lot of lives, but I'm still a human being. I still feel, if you cut me, I will bleed. A dagger was attached to his body. This man believes Susan Atkins has already so bled enough. Television preacher Father Michael Manning is telling his nationwide audience it's time face. to set her free. If they let her out, who could possibly take responsibility for her? I'd be willing to. Um, I've known Susan and I've spoken to the parole board that I'd be willing to give her a job. I, I believe that Susan has changed, and I'm not afraid that of sitting in my desk and all of a sudden her coming with a knife, and that, that's a thing of the past. It's, it's a shame. It's a shame that a woman like Susan, who has all of these talents, and who has all of this need to make reparation, for you will, if you will, for what she's done, that she can't. Uh, society won't allow her. Society won't forgive her, and that, that's a real bother to me. <laughs> American society thinks it already has enough craziness loose on the streets. It was the sex, the drugs and the violence that turned on Susan Atkins after a rotten childhood. Your life, even before Charlie Manson, was not pretty. No, it wasn't. I didn't have a, what you would call an ideal upbringing. I'm the child of two alcoholic parents. I'm a victim of incest. Uh, my mother died when I was 14. I did not do good in school. Uh, I ran away when I was 18 and went to the city and tried When to she left home, she got into drugs in doses that would send anyone crazy. My brain was fried. I probably had over 350 LSD experiences, separate individual experiences in less than a year and a half. I smoked marijuana on a daily basis, anywhere from two or three joints to a lid. Along with the drugs came the bearded guru, Charles Manson, who could talk her into anything, even murder. Yeah, it's kind of silly. Yeah, we've got witches and devils, and uh, one guy come up and said, I, I heard you said you were Jesus. I said, uh, no, man, I ain't said that. He said, I'm glad. He said, I'm damn glad. I said, why? He said, I know you ain't him. I said, how do you know? He said, because I am. <laughs> Did he once seem like a god to you? He had, um, he captured my attention by the power he possessed with his mind to make people feel good about themselves in the beginning. And there was a charisma there. Yeah, there was a charisma there. And I wanted to be a part of that. Do you think he should ever be released? It would be a mistake if he were ever released. You think he is still a threat? Yes. Many Americans obviously worry that if you were released, that you would kill again. I know in my heart I couldn't kill anybody today tomorrow, next year. I could not do it. It's not in me. But could she have killed 17 years ago? What you're about to hear, Susan Atkins has never told her fellow prisoners or the parole board. She now says she lied during her trial because of Charlie Manson's hold on her. Did you or did you not kill Sharon Tate? No, I did not. I thought you told me earlier, though, that why you felt so bad is that I was you're involved. craving forgiveness for what you did. I was involved. I was there. I participated. It's the same thing as actually taking a life in by law. Maybe I could have stopped it. I didn't. So you the mass murderess the now please. says she didn't murder at all. Manson mean? gave the orders, and the other man in the pack, Charles Tex oh, Watson, did the killings. Why couldn't you speak up during the trial and say, I was there, I was part of it, but I didn't kill? The women in the Manson family, at that point in time, were expected to back the men. 
And for some reason, I felt it necessary to take blame upon myself. During the trials, though, you, you laughed at the system, you laughed at the victims. I think that I went along with the program that was laid out. Charlie's program? Yeah. Would you clear up once and for all what your account is? What actually happened? I was instructed to go to the Tate home. And I went into the Tate home. And I saw people brutally murdered. And I was instructed to kill two people. And I could not do it. I just, I couldn't do it. The prosecutor, Stephen Kay, was surprised at her news story, but his assessment of Susan Atkins is still the same. I think Susan Atkins is without a doubt the most dangerous uh, female criminal that I have met in 19 years in the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. And the changes in Atkins' story have made no impression on Doris Tate. The bottom line was they killed her. They killed her and they killed her baby. And being the mother of this child, I am going to do whatever is necessary to see that justice is done. And to have them released and put out on the streets, there is no justice to that at all. Even the priest who wants to set her free thinks she is a murderer. It seems that she did do that. Um, in her mind, I think there's a bit of confusion and yet I think she's living also, when she reflects on that, in a, in a dream world, the world of drugs and whatnot. Um, I suppose in my own heart, I, she probably did. Everything that I was told to do that night, I did with the exception of killing somebody. As incredible then, Susan, as your tale is, how do you convince anyone that you are now telling the truth? I don't know that it's important for me to convince anybody. I know that I live with the truth daily. Whether I killed somebody or I didn't kill somebody, I was there while eight people died needlessly, and I didn't do anything to stop it. That's what I live with, is that I didn't do anything to stop it. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.